Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie For such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66 this is the 12th edition, or the 12th part, of the reading Origin of Futurism and Preterism from this little booklet, and th that's why the video is called Hour of the Truth Meets Inquisition Update, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, Part 12. Tom and I have been sitting here a few evenings, uh, on my time, <laughs> daytime, his time over there in the United States of America, and spend that time to work through this little booklet where we have arrived now at page 58 in the aftermath of, um, what is it called, uh, the tragic aftermath of futurism. And we will start today uh, on the second paragraph on page 58 in the new little uh, chapter called The Antichrist. But before we do so, of course, I want to introduce to you my wonderful brother in Christ over there in the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Yeah, it's just fine, and it's good to be here. And now we're going to get to the nitty-gritty. Who is the Antichrist? Is he someone yet in the future, or is he someone that's been along, uh, been with us throughout the Christian era? Uh, that will be amply answered as we continue. Yeah, that is something that we have been speaking about, of course, in the other parts, but maybe some people fell asleep. I don't know. If they did and they catch this one, then they will surely get awake by this reading and discussion of who the Antichrist is, even according to the author, in this case, Charles Jennings. Who is the Antichrist? Where will he come from? When will he be revealed? What supernatural powers will he display? Maybe he comes from Krypton? Huh? Uh -huh. Has he already been born? These are a host, uh, these and a host of other questions are now the topic of books, of sermons, of seminars and conferences being sponsored by last day prophecy gurus. Oh, and you have a lot of them in the world. 
They have thoroughly convinced the vast majority of modern-day Christendom to the extent that they are infatuated with this unknown charismatic character. According to the futurists, this mysterious one-man epitome of evil has been designated in scripture by many descriptive names such as the little horn, the man of sin, the idle shepherd, the Assyrian, the prince that shall come, and he of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, etc. Um, I am missing in the summation the uh, son of perdition which is a name that is only twice attributed in the Bible to a person, and that is in the first case Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ, and in the second place it is attributed to the Antichrist. The author forgets to put him in the, in the summation. Now the real question is, does the Bible really teach a future one-man Antichrist? The term Antichrist is only found in the Bible five times. In one of these five places, in, sorry, in none of these five places, does it refer to a one-man Antichrist. In considering these five references, where this term is used, an honest-minded Bible student must consider the times and conditions in which they occurred. The Apostle John, in writing his first general epistle, and makes reference to the many people in his day that once identified themselves with the early church but were not genuine Christian believers. They were Antichrist. We can read therefore in 1 John chapter 2 verses 18 through 19. Quote, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not at all of that were not that they were not all of us. Unquote. Sorry for picturing that a little bit. I had problems with my eye here. <laughs> Do you want to make a comment here, Tom? You know, the point is well made by the author that uh, uh, there's nowhere in the Bible where the term Antichrist is used to indicate one individual. And uh, in this case that we've just been given, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, we clearly see all of those who pretended to be part of the congregation and who separated themselves and left we're Antichrist. Okay? Now, uh, that's more than one. That means two or three or more. And in the case of the papacy, we our assertion is that the papacy is the Antichrist, and every successive pope from the first to the last was the Antichrist during his generation, during his reign as pontiff. And uh, the Bible supports the idea that the that the antichrist is not just one individual and uh, this is the main argument that rome has uh, against those who claim that the papacy is the antichrist they say no the antichrist is a single individual a singularity well we're talking about an office we're talking about an office. You see, when one is elected president of the United States, he's always considered president of the United States, even after he's, di he's died. And the next president that he's elected after him is also called president of the United States. And the office, no matter who sits in the Oval Office, is the presidency. And so the office continues even though successive presidents pass out of office. And so that's the context in which the Bible describes this antichrist. You might consider it, and I've seen it referenced this way in many Protestant works, the dynasty of antichrist. Okay? Yes, it's an individual man, but it's whatever individual pope happens to be serving the office. But beyond that, it's not one individual man. It's 
each and every pope in succession can in I the office of the papacy. Go ahead. Can I interrupt you here a little, Tom? Mm -hmm. uh, when we speak about First John, we have to understand that this is still the moment when the Bible uh, in the aftermath of Jesus' death and resurrection has been written. Mm -hmm. uh, the papacy has not yet been founded. And there will a lot of people argue against you, but how can you call the papacy the Antichrist when the Antichrist comes long time after what John says here? Because John says even now there are many Antichrists. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who really think that they have a point. Now, let me let me elaborate that a little bit, okay? Elaborate that a little bit. In another place in the Bible, it is clearly written, whether we come to that today, I don't know, but it is clearly written that first there must come a falling away. Mm -hmm. He who now letteth must be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin, that son of perdition, that little horn, that antichrist is revealed. Mm -hmm. That is speaking about the papacy. Mm -hmm. The antichrist that John speaks about here means that these were people within their congregation, within their church, mm -hmm. within their body of Christ, that left because they were not of Christ. Mm -hmm. In another part in the Bible we read that he who does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh has the spirit of Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And these of those are the people that John speaks about here. Mm -hmm. um, that's why he says even now there are many Antichrists. This mm -hmm. even now, mm -hmm. this even now makes or, or paves the way for the Antichrist office that you were just describing, Tom, to come. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that these people with the spirit of Antichrist are, are already now, even though this is the last time, because there is no time after this time, because Rome keeps ruling, even That's though right. John says this in the time of pagan Rome, and the quote-unquote holy Roman Empire is just the same, so this is the last time, but even now, in the pagan Rome, there are many antichrists. I mean, mm -hmm. please, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that will be an explanation that would set some people off otherwise, because they say, well, when there were many antichrists then, how can now the antichrist be the papacy? And I think this point that I just made... Uh, explain that a little bit, at least in the little words that I can use. Maybe you can give us a little better explanation that I could do. Well, the spirit, of, the spirit of Antichrist was demonstrated in Nebuchadnezzar in ancient Babylon. The spirit of Antichrist was demonstrated in the pharaohs of Egypt who had enslaved God's people and mercilessly treated God's people and even killed their children. Uh, the spirit of Antichrist runs all throughout the Bible. We're given indications of that spirit of, uh, of Antichrist all throughout the Bible. The, spot, the Bible spends a good deal of time in the, both the Old and the New Testament giving us the characteristics that we now find all together at once in the papacy. And these who pretended to be part of this congregation uh, of, of which John speaks were finally identified to be of that spirit of Antichrist, and they left. Okay? Now, now the apostle talked about a great apostasy, and that's leaving the body of Christ, isn't it? Isn't that what the Roman Catholic Church did when they, when, when they uh, united the so-called Christian church with the state in the old pagan Roman Empire before its fall? That was the great apostasy. And then eventually what evolved from that is the elevation of one man as the vicar of Christ, the papacy. And so, so it, it's all beginning in John's time, but it wouldn't culminate until the, the, the rise of the papacy. And even at that point, it continued to develop and attain to itself all the characteristics that are described in the Bible of all the wicked rulers of the Bible 
into just one man. And uh, uh, the papacy is that man. Yeah, I think this development that you are talking about uh, of this falling away that of course starts with uh, 321 uh, when Constantine pronounced uh, uh, or, or proclaimed Christianity as uh, the yeah. state religion in the pa in pagan Rome. Right. And then uh, I think the very first important point is uh, the Council of Nicaea. The uh -huh. very first council of this state church, of this um, state religion of the pagan empire. Because the Council of Nicaea in 325 was the very first council that was held under the uh, name of quote-unquote Christianity, yeah. where actually the Roman Catholic Church formed. Because now it was this quote-unquote Christianity was now a body within the Roman, uh, the, the, the pagan Roman Empire. Yeah. That is the falling away and that is when the spirit of Antichrist in the form of the Bishop of Rome developed. Yes, because from that part on, we read about all these great bishops of uh, Bishop of Rome, Bishop of Constantinople, Bishop of Carthage, and uh, and, and even other uh, other bishops, and that more and more and more. Then, when you, when you go through the history, you see that the Bishop of Rome usurps their authority. Yeah, and that is what we are left with today because the Pope is nothing else but the Bishop of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome. Yeah. As it goes back historically uh, until the 4th century, the beginning of the 4th century with uh, Constantine, I always say baptizing the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity. Yeah, that's all it is. It's just the old Roman Empire uh, redressed in Christian garb. There's nothing changed. The Pope is the Caesar of the quote-unquote Holy Roman Empire. And uh, nothing has changed. It's just uh, the substance of Rome never changed from pagan Rome to papal Rome. It just dressed itself in, in the garbs of Christianity. That's how it goes. Then I will continue now on the second paragraph on page 59. I just wanted to make that sure for our listeners and viewers because, you know, Tom, we always have the scoffers who say, well, yeah, but when John speaks of many antichrists here, how can you say that the papacy is the antichrist? And I think we made uh, just a little bit that point clear for these scoffers. Certainly. The two references to antichrist in verse 18 in First John chapter 2, what we just read, refer to people in John's day that were once numbered with John and the other believers. For some reason, and that reason of course is pagan belief mixing with biblical belief, for some reason they had left the fellowship of believers. John points out that because they left, they left the fellowship that was proof they were never genuine believers to start with. Like Judas Iscariot never was a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said that even himself, that Judas Iscariot was not given by the Father to him, but that he mixed up with the Twelve in the time, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me, please, Tom, if I'm wrong, but I think that I'm right here. I can't think of the particular uh, instance, but it'll come to us later. Maybe even the author will make reference to it here as we go along. Mm-hmm. Now, they were possibly Judaizers in the church for the purpose of perverting the saints from their belief in the sovereign grace of God and the total sufficiency of the cross work of Jesus Christ. A very interesting four words in this last sentence. Mm -hmm. They were possibly Judaizers. Mm -hmm. How often, Tom, have you heard the term Judea, Judaic Christianity, or what is it called? Yes, Judeo-Christianity. Judea, Judaism, Judaism is not Christianity. Judaism is a mixture of Babylonian Talmud and uh, 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 the ancient Jewish religion, the, the ones that Jesus reviled when he was walking the streets of Jerusalem. 
he reviled them. He said, you are your father, the devil, and the devil's work you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. And the Judaizers, in this case, being a part or seemingly to be a part of the Church of Jesus Christ, would have tried to lure those who had their Savior, had their Lamb of God was Jesus, uh, would have wished to return those people back to animal sacrifices on Temple Mount. Now, if that is the case, and not just animal sacrifices, but circumcision and the whole thing, as part of the so-called Jewish law, and that it would be at that time that it would become apparent to the body of Christ that they were not of us. Because anybody who would suggest returning to Temple Mount with sacrifices of lambs and goats and bullocks and pigeons and doves and thing and one thing and another would would uh, would positively identify themselves as antichrist it would be in essence as saying messiah has not come in the flesh any Jew after Jesus who would make an animal sacrifice is simply saying, I do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And we must continue making animal sacrifices according to Jewish law. The natural state of the Jew without accepting Jesus as his lamb is to sacri continue sacrificing lambs on the altar on Temple Mount, or to undergo circumcision and, and all the other ordinances that were, that were taught. Jesus ended all that. You know, now we're circumcised of the heart. And, and now we have Jesus as our lamb. We don't make sacrifices. Anybody who makes a sacrifice is literally telling you by their actions they don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. And likewise, if you believe that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, you're denying that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, and he was not the Messiah, because Daniel prophesied that during the 70th week of Daniel, Messiah would come, and after three and a half years, would be, would, would, uh, would, uh, be crucified, or would die, but not for himself. You see, Satan has all kinds of tricks to trick people into un, to put them under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist. And all these things together, individually and together, are just ways to express the belief that Jesus was not the Messiah. Judaism rejected Jesus as the Messiah. OK, if, if they were trying to uh, turn the body of Christ here, the, the congregation to which John belonged, back into animal sacrifices and circumcision and the law, it simply meant they did not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had not received him as their lamb, and they wished to continue in the old Judish, Judaic way. And... Uh, there was no hope for them. I think also, Tom, something that uh, people nowadays easily forget is that the very first Christians were Jews. That's right. So when they today blame it all on the Jews, they forget that the Jews they blame it on today are not the same Jews which brought us Christianity. Because mm -hmm. without the Jews that were quote unquote converted to Christ Christianity that started the Christian movement anyway because they come out of the uh, out of the body of the apostles uh, w without them we wouldn't have Christianity today that's right so a lot of people who always try to damn things and uh, uh, on the Jews should for once think about what we Gentiles who now have the salvation because of the Jews owe to the Jews because of that that's right because without the Jews, there would not be any Christianity today. 
and uh, in, in that time here, um, I, I think also that is the point why John speaks about the Judaizers. Well, don't make people Jews because Judaize is, is isn't that actually another word as uh, to convert people to Judaism? Yeah, I so would instead of converting to people to Judaism, they are trying to convert people to Christianity. Judaizing is uh, proselytizing for Judaism, for as you rightfully said, this Babylonian mixed belief system of the mm -hmm. Torah of the Old Testament, um, mixed with Babylonian pagan tradition. That's Judaism, yeah. and a lot of people do not understand that. And as long as they don't understand <clears throat> that, they will always, uh, always push push on the Jews for bad things, for that they are even not responsible. I always say. Okay. You know, the Jews only have the power or, or, um, or uh, exercising the power that is given to them by the beast. Yes, you, you, you use the term that we really should focus on right now, and that is the term that is so widely used uh, in so-called Christianity today is called Judeo-Christianity. And do you realize... That Judeo Christianity is an oxymoron. Yeah, the one uh, cannot live with the other. That's right. They're mutually exclusive. Yeah, they as, cannot exist as together. As futurists and preterists, Tom. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no such thing in the world as Judeo Christianity. That's a man-made term to describe nothing but apostasy. You can't mix the holy with the profane. Christianity being the holy and Judaism being the profane. Okay? And the so-called head of this Judeo-Christian world is the papacy. By his, well own, by his own profession. Yeah, very good point. Mm hmm now let's continue with this uh, little Bible quotation here from 1 John chapter 2, verses uh, 22 and 23. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son has the Father also. Unquote. Okay, so... And this is the spirit of Antichrist that John is speaking yeah. about here. That's right. So who who are the Judaizers? Those who have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Okay, they are of the spirit of Antichrist. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son... That is, those who would continue making animal sacrifices, it is they who have denied the Son, the same hath not the Father. So why would anybody who is a genuine Christian ever describe himself as a Judeo-Christian? Only because he doesn't understand the terms used, Tom. Well, either because he doesn't understand the terms, or he's the Pope leading a judeo Christian religion, an oxymoron. A Judeo-Christian religion, if it's Judeo, it's not Christian. They can call it Christianity if they want, but it's, it's, it's the synagogue of Satan. It masquerades as Christianity, but it throws in Jude Judaism, which is a denial that Jesus is the Christ. So we have the spirit of Antichrist dressed up as Christianity. But they don't, they don't even try to shed the Judeo portion. You, you ever notice the papacy wears this little beanie on his head, just like the so-called Jews do? Yeah. Do you, have, you ever notice that the papacy makes sacrifices just like the Jews do? Yeah, they call it or sacraments. Did? It's called the Mass, the yeah. sacrifice of the Mass. The Eucharist. Yeah. The, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy itself, and the Roman Catholic priests who get their authority and power and all, so supposedly, they get it all from the Pope. They have, in their teaching, in their official teaching, they have replaced 
the Jewish priesthood. That's called dispensationalism. Yeah. Well, it, it, it you know, it, 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 forget the term right off the top of my head. Replacement theology is what they call it. Mm -hmm. That the priests of the Roman Catholic Church have replaced the priests of Judaism. And they all believe, they also believe that they're now God's chosen people because the Jews rejected Jesus. Listen, if by their own admission, if by their own admission they, they agree that the Jews rejected and crucified Christ, why in the world would they ever want to call themselves Judeo Christians? Why would they ascribe to their own oxymoron? Good question. It, it's it's just an admission of who their master really is. And Jesus would say to them, just like he said to the Judy, the Jews, you are of your father the devil. You're whited sepulchers. You're you're an abomination before the Lord. Okay? And God is not in your sacrifices, and God will not accept your sacrifices, whether you sacrifice an, a an animal in a bloody sacrifice, or if you sacrifice a piece of bread as they do in the Roman Catholic Church. God is not going to accept any other sacrifice but the sacrifice of his own son. Now, I, I think the term to, to describe the papacy and his priests Judaism fits. Christianity doesn't. But if they wish to keep masquerading as Christianity and, and associate themselves with Judaism, then that ought to be that ought to be a dead ringer for anybody looking at it from the outside in. This well, isn't we could, Christianity. We could actually easily say that the Judaism of the time of the apostles is the Roman Catholic uh, Roman Catholicism of today. That's right. That's what we could say. And that would describe it, uh, I guess, quite perfectly. Roman Catholicism is simply the modern form of Judaism under Christian garb. Mm -hmm. Now, on the last paragraph on page 59, the author continues in reference to 1 John 2, 20-23, what I just read. Here, in this reference, John identifies anyone anyone who denies the divinity of Jesus Christ as being Antichrist. He also calls them a liar. There were many false teachers in John's day who traveled from church to church, to church teaching perverse things about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Many denied that Jesus was the true Messiah and therefore John considered them Antichrist. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 3, 1 through 3, we read, quote, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Unquote. Again, this last part of this last sentence is again making the point we made earlier. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, this is speaking of Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, right, Tom? Uh -huh. And even now already is it in the world, the point that we were making earlier. Now here John gives a warning to beware of these false teachers. John was the same writer who told us that, quote, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, unquote, in John uh, 1 verse 14. John labeled his teaching as being the spirit of Antichrist. He emphasized that this was a spirit and not just an individual person. He said, believe not every spirit, try the spirits. Every spirit that confesses not, he said, that spirit was already in the world in his day. 
that has been well over 1900 years ago. Now in 2 John uh, chapter 7 we read, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Here again John is warning the believers to beware of the many deceivers that existed in his day. These false teachers were considered deceivers and antichrist. Never once in the above five references to antichrist did John refer to the antichrist, one individual man or a future appearance. John did refer to antichrist as being first a spirit in 1 John 4 verse 3 Second, a denial of the incarnation of God in Christ in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. And third, already present in his day, 1 John chapter 2, verses 8, verse 18 and chapter 4, verse 3. And four, liars who denied that Jesus is the Christ in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Five, deceivers in 2 John uh, 7. And verse six uh, and six, there were many who were antichrist in First John two verse eighteen and last and but not least seventh, false believers who left the fellowship in First John chapter two verse nineteen, as we read almost in the beginning of this broadcast, as you remember. Now we come to the probably most important part of the whole book. The next chapter is called here 70 weeks of Daniel. One of the many serious errors of futurism is built upon a misconstruing of the message of the angel Gabriel to the prophet Daniel. Futurism teachers have naively fallen in line with the Jesuit theory that the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy has been separated from the first 69 weeks. This position is taken in order to create a timeline for their whole prophetic scheme. This time period between the 69th and 70th week is conveniently called the gap or parenthesis. This, peri uh, this period is characterized by the quote-unquote age of grace during the church age. This period of approximately 2000 years is when God is dealing with the people they call Gentiles, which, according to the futurist teachers, is everyone that is not a Jew. They promote the idea that during this so-called Church Age, the Lord is mainly calling the Gentile people to form his Gentile bride, while allowing the vast majority of the Jewish people to remain untouched by the Gospel. They say that immediately after the Gentile bride is raptured away, then Jewish evangelism will explode with astounding success. Where do the advocates of such man-made ideas get the audacity to arbitrarily cut off one week from a calendar and build a complete prophetic viewpoint on that one false presupposition? presupposition? Upon this one false premise, they do more injustice to scripture by claiming that the he of Daniel 9 verse 27 refers to a future antichrist. It is clear from the whole context of Daniel's prophecy that the he refers back to the Messiah in verse 26, which was to be cut off. This is plainly referring to the crucifixion of our Lord at Calvary. Gabriel's message to Daniel goes on to say that he, the Messiah, shall, quote, confirm the covenant with many for one week, unquote. Now the confirming of a covenant is what Jeremiah referred to in his prophecy. He proclaimed, quote, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, 
and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Unquote. From mm. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. I think this Jeremiah quote is a very interesting one to go a little bit deeper in, into discussion, Tom. What do you think? Well, certainly Jesus came to confirm a covenant, the covenant in his blood, and he confirmed it by literally becoming the sacrifice. So we know we have a firm covenant because he signed it with his own blood. And Je Jeremiah prophesied that it would come. And it's an unconditional covenant. And uh, it relies upon the mercy of Almighty God and his sovereign will. And uh, uh, But what, what this, <clears throat> this futurist teaching does the, the futurist belief that seven, that Daniel's 70th week has not yet been fulfilled is and won't be fulfilled until the end of the quote-unquote church age, what consequence does that have for the Jews? We've already discussed what consequence it has for those who profess Christ. Out of one side of their mouths, they profess Christ, but if they believe in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, they deny that Messiah has come in the flesh. Because Daniel's prophecies prophesies the coming of the uh, Jesus in the flesh during that 70th week. At the beginning of that 70th week, three and a half years later, he would give up his own life and become the sacrifice that Jeremiah was talking about. You see, Satan has tricked God's people into believing a lie. All right, now what, what consequence does this futurist lie hold for the Jews? Well, it discourages Christians from proselytizing or preaching Jesus to a Jew because they believe that the Jews are going to receive their Messiah at the end of this 2,000 years after the church age is over and God has called out all of his Gentiles. What about all every every Jew throughout the 2,000 year of, of the Christian church? We've let them go to hell. They've not preached Jesus to them. They have their own means of salvation, a different one than we have. You see, that is the root and essence of dispensational futurism. It proposes one means of salvation for the Gentile and another, a different means of salvation for the Jew. And what do we see the, the whole Christian world talking about now? Well, the reinstitution of the Judaic priesthood, a, a rebuilding of the temple, and a, and, a, and a peace treaty with the Jews that allows them to build that temple and to begin animal sacrifices again thus denying once again that they, re that they reject the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world and the one that they slew 2,000 years ago. It all works in concert together to completely condemn the Jews and to lock up the kingdom of heaven so that the Jew can't get in. That's what futurism does. That's what the teaching about a future 70th week of Daniel does. Listen, if, if the Jews don't receive their Messiah until the future 70th week, what Christian is going to witness to a Jew during the church age? Futurism asserts falsely that there's a different salvation for the Jew than there is for the Gentile. And that their salvation won't come until the end of time. That's why Christians don't go out of their way to, to, to proselytize and to preach the gospel to Jews. Now, the other way around works much better because there are a lot of people who are uh, 
being proselytized into uh, Judaism. Yeah. Taking the Jewish belief system. You know, Tom, what I wanted to, to make clear actually is in Jeremiah that a lot of people will not understand this correctly because they have a false picture of Israel. Uh, Israel, we are speaking here about uh, in Jeremiah, he is not speaking about the tribes of the blood of Israel, but he is speaking of the spiritual Israel. That's right. He's talking about those who are born of the Spirit of God. But there are that's many people the from who don't understand that, and that's the problem. And that's why they all interpret all the other things wrong. And they say, yeah. well, yeah, but there's there's a new covenant made with us. No, that new covenant, well, that's what Jesus made. And he promised you that salvation is through grace, in faith, alone. That is the new covenant that was first brought to the Jews. And after they rejected it, it was brought to the Gentiles. It uh, goes on to say here in that um, in that little saying from, from the covenant, um, he said that I will put my law in their inward parts. Yeah. So that's about the circumcision. Because the circumcision was an outward sign of the Israelites of the Old Testament. When they got their circumcision um, outward, God says here, I will put my law on the inward parts. We are yeah. now circumcised by the heart. That's and right. write it in their hearts, as he says here. Yeah. Yeah? So, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people just don't get the Bible right. But when you get the Bible mm. right, these verses all of a sudden make so much sense. Yeah. And they give you such an insight that all of a sudden you have the chance to discover the lie that you were living in. To yes. discover the lie that was taught to you from your from your cradle. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing here. I can't name you right off book, chapter, and verse, but it says, he is not a Jew who is a Jew outwardly, but who is a Jew inwardly. Again, dealing with the circumcision. So, yeah. that's, that's right. Israel, as, as God perceives it, which is the only way we should perceive it, is all of those who has, have accepted him and his propitiation for our sins. That's the Israel of the Bible. The yeah. only true Israel that ever was. That's right. Because even though in the Old Testament Israel was a tribe of um, 12 bloodlines, mm -hmm. it resembled actually Bible-believing people, mm -hmm. or God-believing people, I should say, not Bible-believing, but God-believing people, God-fearing people, God's commandments-keeping people, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were. From Jacob yeah. sprang these 12 tribes. It's the belief that That's gave right. the possibility for Jacob to put up, uh, to, 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 to get 12 sons who have the same belief that he did. Yeah. who believed in the God of heaven, in the creator God, who kept his commandments. And by that belief, they were giving that belief from father to son, as actually was intended already in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. That if Adam and Eve have not, uh, would not have fallen from, from, the, uh, from faith, I'd say, because that actually was when they listened rather to the serpent than to God. That was the original intention already. Israel always is a spiritual people. It never was only blood related. Okay, in the Old Testament, let's say, quote unquote, coincidentally, the people who believed in God were also of one blood because they came from, from Jacob. But eventually Israel is everyone who believes in in God. That's why also God changed Jacob's name into Israel. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why. And mm -hmm. once you understand that, and, and ex this Jeremiah 31, I think, is, is very important, Tom. Maybe we can uh, one time uh, read for our uh, listeners in the King James Bible the chapter 31 of Jeremiah. It seems quite interesting to do that one time. And uh, we, we can discuss that a little bit. I mean, we are not Bible teachers, but we can share with the people how we understand it. And I think that here and there, there are some terms that um, 
that could wake some people up. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. means I will make a new covenant with everyone who believes in me. That's actually what he says here. Not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my, <coughs> which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them. So I made, a, uh, I, I made already a covenant with them, but they went a whoring. Israel yeah. always went af other, af uh, other af after, what do I have with my tongue here today? Israel always went after other gods. That's right. Although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord, he always was faithful to the people. The people were not faithful to him. But yeah. this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. That's what we have today. And will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least to the, of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's Jesus. Jesus the is the sin forgiver, yeah. That's right. The covenant in his blood. And uh, none of it leaves any responsibility to the man. It's an unconditional covenant. It's God who calls, God who chooses, God who saves. And man can't mess it up like man messed up the other covenants that God gave, which were dependent upon Israel's obedience. They broke the covenant. It was of no effect. But we can't break the covenant that Jesus made because it was a one-sided covenant, all dependent upon him and what he did. Number one, he was born of a virgin according to the prophecies. He came right at the end, of the, at the very beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, 483 years after Daniel prophesied that he would come, or after the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Messiah the Prince came after the 69th week, which literally means at the beginning of the 70th week. You mark the beginning of the 70th week by Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Three and a half years later, he confirmed the covenant in his blood on on temple on 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 the mountain of, of, of Golgotha in Jerusalem shedding his blood for many, the wolves who were called and chosen of God received him. He caused them to receive him. Okay? There, man did not participate in this. As a matter of fact, his, his, his disciples, who we would believe would be wiser than this, actually tried to prevent him from going to the cross. Now, which one of us are better than the disciples? And what had what would happen if they had prevented him from going to the cross? There would be no salvation for anybody. Jesus had to do it alone, and he had to do it in spite of his own people. They had nothing to say or to do about his crucifixion, that act by which he redeemed us. Okay? So, the Bible says, to as many as received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God. And it says, also, in addition to that, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and no one shall come to me except the Father draw him. You see, 
the believer's completely left out of the picture. It's God who calls, God who chooses, God who saves, and God who glorifies. It's God who sanctifies, it's God who justifies, and it's God who glorifies. It's all God's doing. Salvation is by grace through faith, yet not of yourselves. You had nothing to do with it. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. There's many people in the world believe they chose Christ. Oh, Even yeah. I did before I became more mature in the Scriptures. I did too in the beginning. I thought oh. I thought I found Christ through my New World Order research that I did. Oh. Yeah, that in a way it is true. It is that God tipped that guy that brought me to that research on the shoulder the cho to show me that way, and yeah. that was God's way to show himself to me. But it's, he showed himself to me, not I found him, but right. he used these researches that I did to show himself to me. Mm -hmm. And then he said, here I am, now what are you going to do with it? Are you yeah. going to accept me, or are you going to throw the door into my face? Now remember... If you accept him, it's because God caused you to will and to do his good pleasure. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can't even claim credit for choosing him. No. You chose him because God elected you and drew you to him because there's nothing in man that seeks after God. No. Nope. There is none righteous, no, not one. Absolutely. They have all gone astray. There's none that seeketh righteousness. Righteousness has to be imputed to them. That's God's business, God's doing, not ours. It's, it's like Jesus said, uh, deny yourself. And nobody can deny himself from, from, from out himself. You can only deny yourself when God makes you to, when God right. ordains it to you. Uh -huh. Nobody will ever deny himself only because he wants to. Nobody wants to do that. So Pride is in the way. Pride is in the way, Tom. No. That is exactly the reason why, why, why Lucifer fall from heaven. Mm -hmm. Pride is in the way of us humbling ourselves to make ourselves so little that we can be accepted by God. Yeah. This very issue is the thing we're dealing with every morning now on Inquisition Update. The sovereignty of God and the total depravity of man. Mm. Oh, yeah, you are it's, reading about this Arianism uh, moment in, in the book, uh, The Foundations no, Under Armini Attack? No, Ar Ar Arminianism. Arminianism, yeah, what did I say? Ar Arminianism. You said Arianism. Yeah, Armenianism. And then, and, yeah. Then you, and then you said Arminianism. No, it's Arminianism. Arminianism, yeah, okay, sorry. Named after That's Arminius. Right. Arminius yeah. was a heretic, and he denied the sovereign grace of God and said that man is not completely fallen and that by the exercise of his own free will, he can choose God, which runs counter to everything in the Scripture. Mm. Okay. We know that in the covenant of Jesus Christ, which he confirmed in his own blood, it doesn't depend on participation at all from man himself. God does it all. God causes us to will and to do his good pleasure. If we make a so-called decision for Christ, it was because the Father wooed us. It's because the Father called us, God chose us, and caused us to will and to do his good pleasure. Until you come to the realization and the understanding of the Scripture, you might have convinced yourself that you, you chose Christ. But a careful reading of the Scripture, and not even a careful one, it, it is borne out all throughout the, the Scripture of the New Testament, that it's God who saves, God who calls, 
God who chooses and God who causes us to will and to do his good pleasure. A man who would hide from God because his sins were evil. That's why no man seeketh after God. No, no, not one. Okay, There's nothing inherent in man that would cause him to turn to God. It's God who causes us to will and to do his good pleasure. I'm repeating myself over and over and over, but listen, it's necessary because in all the churches they teach free will. Okay, Calvinism. and that that is the tenet that uh, free will is the tenet of the Roman Catholic Church. It's a man-centered gospel. Okay? Yeah, that was that was also what Calvin t taught, right? No, Calvin taught the sovereignty of God, the divine election of God. Calvin taught biblical Christianity. We have the five points of Calvinism. And they deny Roman Catholicism. Because in Roman Catholicism, you have to have free will. All the churches that call themselves Protestant or evangelical churches who preach free will are literally Roman Catholic in their teaching. Hmm. Free will is Roman Catholicism. It suggests that the gospel is man-centered, that salvation is man-centered, that salvation comes, apart, uh, comes about by the independent, sovereign will of man when the Bible clearly teaches otherwise. All right. Now, if you open up the gospel to a man-centered gospel that man participates in his own salvation— then the door is left wide open for the man of sin to command us all to make this free choice. Okay? Exercise your free will. And by the way, while you're at it, come to Mass and, and worship Mary by your own free will and, and, uh, and confess your sins to a priest, and a sin-sick priest. Oh, uh, yeah. See? And with... When you believe, when you believe and understand the scriptures the way they are written, there's no need for a pope. Jesus is all in all. It's even Jesus, or God, who causes us to will and to do His good pleasure. Without the sovereignty of God, you have another man is the center of Christianity, the papacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really, the sovereignty of God. What 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 Calvin preached is not unique to Calvin. I mean, the, the five tenets of Calvinism have been believed by all Bible believers throughout the centuries, throughout the whole entire Christian era. Calvinism just preached it among the Protestant reformers. Okay? We call it Calvinism, but it's not Calvinism. It's biblical truth. We associate it with John Calvin, but John Calvin didn't write this, or it would be fallible. Okay, this comes from the authorized King James Version of the Bible, the only Bible that supports Calvinism, supports the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> you know, without the sovereignty of God, as demonstrated by the covenant that Jesus made on the cross— then you have a man-centered gospel. It takes the salvation of man out of God's hands and puts it in a man's hands. It's not safe in a man's hands. No. Look, look, I, I, I made the comparison already. Even his own disciples prevented, tried to prevent him from going to the cross. Now, now, Look, to say it this way, if there was any portion of our salvation left to our free will, we would screw it up. Okay, the Bible teaches the total depravity of man. I make the analogy on my program on Inquisition Update. When you climb aboard a multi-engine, heavy, wide-body jet, and go in and sit down and fasten your seatbelt, does the 
pilot of the plane invite you to come forward and help him locate your destination or to help him fly the airplane or to in any way uh, influence what's happening in the cockpit? No. Well, Jesus is our pilot. He's the only one that knows how to save us. He's the only one that knows where we're going and how we're going to get there. He's the only one that's qualified to fly the airplane. And if he allows any passenger to come forward to the cockpit and shares his throne with anyone else, there's bound to be a catastrophe. All right? This is the covenant that Jesus made with us. Whereas before it depended upon the, the obedience of man, now it's a done deal. And it's got we are saved by grace through faith in the in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Which one of us could assist Jesus on the cross? Not one of us. It's an autonomous salvation. It's not dependent upon us in any way. Okay? No, it's like we had nothing to do with the fall of we, man, so we have nothing to do with the salvation of man. No. No. It's completely taken out of our hands. That's the proper, the scriptural understanding of how our salvation comes about. It's God. It's all God from beginning to end. Man does not participate in his own salvation, though he may, as a young Christian, be led to believe that he participated. When you become mature in the scriptures, you understand it was God who caused you to choose him. It's still God, see? All right? And uh, uh, this is biblical truth. Now, if God is all in all in the salvation of man, what need do we have of, of a pope? What need do we have of a priest? None. And that's why the whole Protestant world left in droves the Roman Catholic Church because they understood the covenant that Jesus confirmed in his own blood that's not dependent at all upon man. It's all one-sided. Okay? It's an inviolable covenant. Man cannot violate it. Because none of it is determinable, determinable upon, upon man. Okay? This is when the first time in your life comes when you realize that you had nothing whatsoever to do with your salvation. It was all then you can finally, for the first time in your life, rest, peace. This is the peace that passeth all understanding. Yeah, to understand the grace. Yes, grace, a free gift. Grace, unmerited favor. That means it was not earned. It was simply given. This is how we have righteousness imputed to us. Instead of infused through sacraments. Yeah, yeah. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's completely out of our hands. It's God who calls, God who chooses, God who woos, God who causes us to will and to do his good pleasure, we, see, we receive him because he caused us to. Otherwise, we would never seek him. We would always try to hide. I gave the example this morning. Look, when Adam and Eve fell, they instantly recognized something was wrong. So they'd be sewing fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. They tried to cover up their own nakedness. They tried to come to their own form of salvation. Tried to participate in their own modesty. Okay? 
what did Jesus do? Come he fashioned skins. He fashioned for them coats of skins. Does that mean he left the fig leaves on them? No, they were insufficient to cover. Their efforts were insufficient to cover their fallenness, their 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 nakedness. But it was by the coats of skins they were covered. And where do you suppose we get the term from the Bible, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Jesus made a sacrifice, the first sacrifice of a lamb, and covered them with coats of skins. The fig leaves were insufficient. Their efforts to cover their nakedness was insufficient. They couldn't have any part of their salvation. Well, the so fig leaves, Jesus, on, the fig leaves so only G covered their, their physical nakedness, but not their spiritual nakedness. Well, the, the analogy still holds that it was Jesus and Jesus alone that could cover their nakedness. Yeah, sure. I, I don't want to complicate it with any, anything else. It was Jesus... <laughs> It was Jesus and Jesus alone that covered their nakedness without any help whatsoever from either Adam or Eve. Okay, we have the first, the first example of the autonomous sovereignty of God demonstrated right there in the Garden of Eden. It's not of works lest any man should boast. That's the covenant that was made with Jesus. That was the covenant that Jesus confirmed on the cross. And if you ever come to the truth in this sin-sick world, it's because God willed it, not you. And so now we can live in peace. Our salvation is secure. We don't have to suffer like the Jews did, who break God's covenant, who broke his covenant, this covenant is unconditional. You receive him and accept his blood as your atonement because God wills you to. And if God does not will you to, then you don't. You do what man does hide from God because their deeds were evil, the Bible says. And this is the glorious covenant we have with Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of it. We had no part of it. That's why we can call it freely a gift. Now, what about those who believe in free will? Well, they participated in their own salvation because they chose Jesus. And they spend the rest of their Christian life working to prove their Christianness. One day they're saved, and the next day they're going to hell. They turn right around, and they feel saved the next day, and the next day they believe they're going to hell. They're doubting. They're, they're never good enough. They never can do enough. There's no rest in the free will segment of the so-called Christian world. Is that also the reason um, that we have in the Roman Catholic Church this chastisement? The sacraments. That's why we have the sacraments. That's why we have penances. That's, you know, we. I, I'm using we. I don't know why. I'm not part of that mess. But... Roman Catholics are continually working for their salvation. They have to come to Mass. They have to come to confession. They have to do this. They have to do that. They have to seek public office in order to, to, to help make America and the world Catholic. They're, they're, they, have to, they have to worship Mary. They have to pray to the saints. Uh, they have to, all, all of it, the whole thing is, is a religion of works. And they have to conform their will to the will of the Roman Catholic Church. It's all, the, a, a Roman Catholic salvation is never accomplished, even in the grave, because they have to go to purgatory after they die to purge off whatever sins they didn't confess to the priest. 
that in Ro the Roman Catholic Church, there's no such thing as assurance of salvation. As a matter of fact, officially, the Roman Catholic teach the Roman Catholic Church teaches the sin of presumption. Okay, that's the sin according to the papacy that I commit every time I say I am saved. Because God called me, God chose me, God sent his son to die for me, and my righteousness is imputed to me, just like God promised. And I had nothing to do with it. Rome says that's the sin of presumption. If I were a Roman Catholic, I would have to confess that sin to a priest and then perform some... Perform some uh, what, what is the term they use to describe it? Some penance, either a gift to the church or to crawl up and down a, a flight of stairs on my bloody knees or so many times around, uh, you know, the, the cathedral on my knees, pray the rosary so many times, and then and only then do I get, receive absolution from the priest. There's no rest for the Roman Catholic whether he be a card-carrying Roman Catholic or whether he be a Baptist Roman Catholic or a Presbyterian Roman Catholic or a Lutheran Roman Catholic or an Episcopal Roman Catholic, they go by all kinds of names, but they're all trying to help God save them. They've got about as much luck helping God to save them as they would to help the pilot get the multi-engine, heavy-bodied, wide jet to its destination safely and land on the numbers on the end of the runway. It ain't going to happen. And that's why I call them the Baptist Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Roman Catholic Church, the Episcopalian Roman Catholic Church, the Methodist Roman Catholic Church. If they preach free will, they're preaching Roman Catholicism. I don't care what name they go by. And they have denied the covenant, the unconditional covenant that Jesus provided for us and then wooed us by the Spirit to receive. The natural man perceives not the things of the Lord. The natural man would come kicking and screaming into the, into the kingdom of Christ were it left to any part of his free will. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches. That's why when it comes to my salvation, I have perfect peace. I have perfect rest in Jesus. I don't feel saved one day and then feel damned the next. I don't feel like there's more that I must do to prove my my salvation. My salvation is guaranteed. Jesus paid it all. What part did I have in that? What assistance did I have while he was hanging on the cross? None. None of us did. Okay? I could make the point a million different ways for the next 10 weeks, but I think I've said enough. Free will, free will is Roman Catholicism. Sovereign grace is true biblical Christianity. And every single one of the Protestant reformers believed in the sovereignty of God. And they were comfortable and satisfied in their salvation. They were assured of it because they weren't allowed to have anything to do with it to mess it up. All right, back to you then. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I think you are absolutely right. Uh, you can teach this for the next weeks uh, on the Internet, and still there are people who say, no, that is not that way, because this and this and this, I understand like this and this and this. Mm -hmm. And that's only because they take their own understanding instead of God's understanding as the basis. Yeah. It's, um, you know, the the problem also is a little bit, and, and you said that already in private discussions earlier, when you tell people uh, God, is in, God is in control and we have nothing to do with it and uh, 
uh, there is no free will and God is in command, it's, it's God's sovereignty. There are a lot of people who just uh, won't accept that because then, we are, then they just say, so we are all just controlled puppets on a string. Yeah, it well, that's not, nonsense. Yeah, of course it's nonsense. It, it has nothing to do with being controlled puppet on a string. It has, it has to do with the grace of God because the Bible says that there are some uh, destined for damnation and some destined for salvation. Mm -hmm. The Bible says it itself. It's, it's not our choice because, as you, I think, made the point quite clear, if, it were, if the choice was up to us, we would screw it up anyway. Yeah. Because everything man touches, he screws up. That's right. Just look into the history. There's nothing <laughs> man ever touched that did not get, get screwed up in the end. Only yeah. the things that God touches are yep. leading to perfection. Yep. Um, I think that was uh, quite a very interesting way that our reading and discussion of the book, uh, the history or the origin of futurism and preterism took today, Tom. But I want to leave it here after an hour and 20 minutes almost because I know I don't want to stress your voice too much. You also have to do your um, ministry on Inquisition update tomorrow on First Amendment Radio and we will come... Yeah. Uh, next time back here and then continue the reading on page 62 um, because uh, you know there are a, a many Bible quotations in here and I think for next time it is interesting that I will take a little bit uh, into the study um, that we will not only name the Bible citations given here in that book but that we will also look them up and read them mm. for even getting a deeper understanding because I think that is what most people who are listening to us and watching this video still lack. And even we lack that sometimes, because mm -hmm. when we say we are perfect, we are the first who are wrong. Nobody is perfect, neither we are. So the no. more Bible quotations we can use and the more Bible citations we can use in this study of this little booklet in the end, I think the more that we will confirm our point to the people who will really understand and are really seeking the truth, Tom. Yes. So with your agreement, uh, I, I want to close it up. Do you have any closing remarks to our listeners and viewers of the video, Tom? Yes, I would just like to part with this. Those who believe that they have participated in their salvation through free will are characterized by one thing that seems to be universally uh, uh, demonstrated, and that is pride, you know? But those who believe in the sovereignty of God, the independent sovereignty of God, are marked by humility. That's the difference. Pride marks those who boast of free will of having, of their own free will, chosen Christ. But for those who are completely dependent upon the sovereign grace of God, they are marked by a different mark, the mark of humility. The Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. Think about it. And there's one other point I would like to make. We've talked ex voluminously, and we're not done talking about futurism, but I'm glad we ended the program today talking about free will versus the sovereignty of God. Because free will and futurism go hand in hand. They are both Roman Catholic, and they both serve the end desired most by the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist of the Bible. Without futurism and without the, the sovereign will of man, Rome would fall flat on her face, and so would the ecumenical movement. With that, I'll close with a blessing to your listeners. Blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, our Messiah and Lamb of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the true and only King of kings and Lord of lords. Thanks, Yerk. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Tom, for your contribution to the broadcast today. 
and to my listeners and viewers of the video another time of course so that you know how you can reach Tom when you have any questions or remarks you can uh, contact Tom under tom at seawaves.us tom at seawaves.us like the waves of the sea and send him an email with your questions and remarks and if you want to reach me you can of course uh, refer to the comment section of the video or send a personal message via my YouTube channel um, that you are watching this video on and of course in the end of this video there are a few suggestions and playlists and also in the description box of this video there are other playlists that hopefully you will have a look on and that will also increase your study and um, it's um, an interesting study that we did today is an interesting study that do, that we do with this whole little booklet the origin of futurism and preterism a few pages before the end but we are long from done because even if this book is done this subject never is done of being taught so until next time juggler 66 from hour of the truth signing off says god bless you all and until next time bye bye we must start at the foot of the cross for our souls in danger we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.